So in the last video, we finished up what we knew about this graph by using our college algebra information. So now it's time to jump right into what we can learn by using our calculus and our derivative information. And we do that by setting our derivative equal to zero. So we need to find the derivative of this function. And we do that by using our quotient rule. So low d high, the original of the low times the derivative of my high, 6x plus 11, minus high d low, the original of the high times the derivative of my low, all over low low, or all over my denominator squared. I'm going to simplify this by distributing everything in my smaller parentheses to my larger parentheses, and then distributing my negative. So if I distribute my 6x through all of this, that gives me 6x to the third minus 30x squared minus 36x. Then if I distribute my 11 through all of that, that gives me plus 11x squared minus 55x minus 66 minus now I distribute my 2x through all of this. 6x to the third plus 22x squared minus 8x. And then distribute my negative 5 through. Minus 15x squared minus 55x plus 20. And that is all over the same thing in my denominator. Now let me distribute my negative through by switching signs. So negative, negative, positive, 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 negative. Okay, now these parentheses here don't matter, so I can just combine like terms. Well, my 6x cubed and my negative 6x cubed cancels out, so let me combine all of my x squared. Negative 30x squared plus 11x squared minus 22x squared plus 15x squared. And so that gives me a negative 26x squared. Now let me combine all of my x's. A negative 36x minus 55x plus 8x plus 55x. Well, my 55x's cancel out, so I just need to do negative 36 plus 8, and that gives me a negative 28x. And last, my constant term, minus 66 minus 20, gives me a negative 86. And that is still, of course, all over my denominator squared. So I found my derivative, and now I need to take this derivative and I need to set it equal to zero. Well, I know I can cancel out my denominator by doing my magic trick, so I just need to set my numerator equal to zero. The first thing that I want to do is I want to factor. So let me factor out a negative two. That leaves me with a positive 13x squared plus 14x plus a 43. And I need to worry about when that is equal to zero. So we can try and continue to solve this by factoring, but unfortunately it doesn't factor. So what I'm going to do with this inside piece here then is to do my quadratic formula. So I have x is equal to negative b or negative 14 plus or minus square root of b squared, 14 squared, minus 4 times my a value of 13 times my c value of 43, all over 2 times my a value. Gives me negative 14 plus or minus a positive 196 minus 2,236, all over 26. If I simplify this square root, 
that gives me square root of negative 2,040. And that's actually enough for me to stop there, because if I have square root of a negative, that's going to give me something i, which is imaginary. So the only way my derivative is going to be equivalent to zero is if I have imaginary numbers. That means that I don't have any answers here, which means I don't have any critical values, so no critical values, which means I have no maximums, no minimums, or no plateaus on this graph. And that's okay. Not all graphs need to have maximums, minimums, or plateaus. But we still need to figure out where this graph is increasing or decreasing. So we still need to do a number line. Now you might think, well, I don't have anything to put on the number line. And if that was the situation, that's okay. You still need to do one test interval. But we actually do have things to put on the number line. We have our domain to worry about on the number line. So we need to put my vertical asymptotes on my number line here. So moving to a new page, because I ran out of room, but I still have my derivative here. And I need to do my number line. So I didn't have any critical values, so this gave me no critical values. I don't have any of those to put on the number line, but I do have my vertical asymptote, which were 6 and negative 1 to put on the number line. So negative 1 and 6. And these are vertical asymptotes, so that's how I'm going to draw them so I don't forget them when I go to put this on the graph. Okay, so I need to do test points, something less than negative 1. Let's do negative 2. Something between these, I can do 0, and something greater than 6, I can do 7. Now, I actually have a little bit more factored version of the numerator. Remember, I factored out a negative 2, and so that leaves me with a 13x squared plus 14x plus 43 over my denominator squared. That might make it a little easier when I go to plug in test points. The thing that I do know is when I plug in test points, I don't have to worry about what the sign of the denominator is going to be because I know it's guaranteed to be positive because it's an even power. This is guaranteed to be a negative, so the only thing that I have to worry about substituting something in for here is this one there. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one of these I'm looking at. My first piece is always going to be negative. I have to worry about my second piece and my denominator is going to be positive. So let me fill that in for every single one of these. So all I need to worry about is what's in that back parentheses there. If I plug in negative 2 to this back set of parentheses, I use my calculator for a little bit of help. When I plug it in there, I get 67, which says that this is positive. So if I take negative times positive divided by positive, that gives me negative which means that this piece over here is decreasing. If I plug zero in there, the only thing I end up with with my constant term, and that's of course positive, so that all simplifies to give me negative, which tells me that this piece here is also decreasing. If I plug a positive number in there, everything's going to end up to be positive, so this is going to be positive, so this is also going to be negative, so this is also going to be decreasing. So basically, this graph is decreasing throughout the whole piece. The only thing it's separated by is the vertical asymptotes at negative 1 and 6. Now, this gives me a lot more information than what I knew back from college algebra. Okay, so let's plot all of the details that we found in the first four steps combined with the sign chart that we just had here, and that should give us a very good visual of the graph. Okay, so our domain said that we had vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 1 and 6. Our end behavior had a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 3. We had an intercept, the y-intercept at 0, 2 thirds, and we had x-intercepts at 1 third and negative 4. We found that it was decreasing throughout the whole graph, separated by vertical asymptotes. So negative infinity to negative 1, 
negative 1 to 6, and 6 to infinity. And we did not have any maximums or any minimums. Okay, so I have a vertical asymptote at negative 1. Let me graph these in red so hopefully we can see them a little bit better. And it's 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have a horizontal asymptote at 3. I had a y-intercept at 2 thirds, an x-intercept at 1 third, and negative 4. And that my graph was decreasing the whole way. Okay, so all we need to do now is to fill in the graph with knowing that the graph is decreasing the whole way. So on the left part of my graph, if it's got to follow my asymptotes and hit my point and decrease the whole way, the only option we have is it for to curve around and do this. Follow my horizontal asymptote on the left and my vertical asymptote right here. In the middle, again, we know it's got to follow my vertical asymptotes, it's got to hit my two points, and it's got to decrease the whole way. So the only option that we have for that to happen is it to follow my vertical asymptote there, curve around, hit those two points, and then follow that vertical asymptote over there. On the right, you might have to try and figure out which one it's going to be. But if I know it's decreasing, then I know it's got to be this one up here on the top. Because if I drew it below my x-axis, then it would be increasing the whole way. So that leaves me with my only option there. The last thing that we need to do is double check this with the graphing calculator. So I have my function typed into my graphing calculator. If I graph it on the standard window, that gives me this here. Now we only see a little tiny portion of the very right hand side of our graph, so we might need to adjust our window to see a little bit more. Let me increase my x values by just a little bit, five units and let me increase my y values by the same, five units. And now when we graph it, we should see the whole thing. Decreasing on the left part of our graph, decreasing in the middle and intercepting both the y and the x axis, and decreasing on the right. Remember the graphing calculator will not graph asymptotes, but if we were to compare this with what we have drawn, we can see that it matches exactly. So now we have went through all the steps of how to graph functions with using what we knew from college algebra combined with the calculus that we've just learned. And now we find a very efficient way to graph on our own. And then, of course, I always recommend to double check it with the graphing calculator. So this ends this example here.